Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. What is it like to be in the shoes of a Border Patrol agent interrogating a member of the Muslim community and determining their fate? It's a situation few of us are most likely to experience, but with Terminal 3 Augmented Reality Director Asad J. Malik attempts to change that by putting us right in the middle of that experience. Let's take a look. Cultural augmentation is when you can bring a hologram of a person in a space that they wouldn't be able to inhabit in real life. It challenges people by forcing them to share presence with ideologies and humans that they otherwise wouldn't cross paths with. At OneRig, our work is focused on using augmented reality to bridge the divides caused by physical barriers such as walls and borders. In our upcoming project, Terminal 3, the viewer steps into the shoes of a U.S. customs officer to interrogate a hologram of someone who appears to be a Muslim. Terminal 3 sits in a very interesting space between fiction and non-fiction. All these holograms are very real people, with very real stories that they're trying to tell in this context of a surreal interrogation. In an uncanny way, these holograms do have a presence in the room. We capture these interviews as 3D volumetric holograms that then the viewer can experience using the Microsoft HoloLens. We use DepthKit as our capture technology to allow us to shoot volumetric video using a DSLR calibrated to a depth sensor. The most fascinating part of the project is that the viewer can actually use their own voice to ask holograms questions with answers that are pre-recorded. Each hologram's story is told using a complex branching narrative that the viewer can navigate through. We give the viewer a lot of agency in terms of the narrative. You can ask the holograms questions like if they've been associated with the Taliban, or you can ask intimate questions like, what's your relationship with the moon? Because of the branching narrative, this project requires a much more interactive soundscape and score. So when one of the holograms is telling you about her trip to the Sahara, you can actually hear the car in the distance and the footsteps in the sand walk right through you. We use Unity to build the interactive game mechanics of our story. The hologram starts off very abstracted, and as the viewer asks questions and gets to know the story, it starts to appear more realistic. At Riot, we believe in the power of immersive storytelling. It made sense to have the one Rick team work out of the Riot offices to not only showcase their amazing cutting edge technology and augmented reality, but to also create something that was meaningful and impactful. Terminal 3 really showcases the presence that AR enables. By the end of the experience, you will have shared moments of great personal intimacy with a hologram. Everybody, please welcome Asad J. Malik. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I, I feel like I should, uh, I, at the beginning of this, I said interrogate a member of the Muslim community, but I think it's a perceived member of the, of the Muslim community because so much of this is based on our assumptions of, you know, the quote unquote other, right? It's not specifically a person, you're, you know, you don't go in there specifically interrogating a member of the Muslim community, right? Yeah, so frequently <laughs> your passport says you're a Muslim, but that may or may not justify your religious beliefs or faith. So. Um, in fact, in Terminal 3, the holograms you get to interrogate, some of them are outspoken atheists, some of them are very practicing Muslims, some of them have a bit more of a new age kind of uh, spiritual belief, but still tied in Islam. So the idea behind the project to begin with is that ideology can be vary between humans and ideology should be criticized and can be criticized, but what people deserve at the end of the day is a basic level of respect for just being human. Yeah. When did you, uh, I want to dive, you know, specifically into everything about Terminal 3, but when did you start becoming an augmented reality director? And what did you direct before augmented reality? Because I, you know, <laughs> five years ago, were people directing augmented reality? Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, a director is an interesting term. Um, I feel like just because we're premiering at a film festival, um, a lot of film terms are, are just kind of thrust upon you. Mm -hmm. um, I started working with augmented reality in particular around a year and a half ago, and I'm still in college, and I just got, I ordered a Microsoft HoloLens, and the idea was I wanted to explore what augmented reality could do and what the potential of it was, because I was really intrigued by both virtuality and augmented reality and um, all the things that could be possible because of that. 
um, and just working with technology in general and trying to understand the relationship between cultural change and technology. Um, I got one of those headsets and I just worked uh, with it for around a year and just started uh, started understanding the very unique potential it had in, in regards to storytelling and the kind of how it can impact the space you, uh, you perceive the content in. And with that in mind, I started working on Terminal 3, which was the name itself came around three, four months ago. So it's actually very recent. Um, that's around when we got into Tribeca. And um, before this project was done by a different name, but we've more or less been working on this for the last six months. Yeah. What, where did the idea come up? Where did you come up with the idea to have it be a border patrol agent interrogating somebody? How did that, how did that come to you? Uh, I thought I'd work with something that, was, that I was an expert on. And been interrogated before? Yeah. So, I mean, every single time I travel, uh, I'm interrogated, taken into secondary screening. Something I've just come to expect at this point and something that is not unique to me in any way. I think any other brown person with a Muslim name probably goes through that. Um, I have a bit more experience with that. Um, I've also been interrogated by the FBI at this point. Really? Um, yeah. So I went to Libya during the war at some point. Yeah. That would do that. That would do it. <laughs> um, so I was in Libya, and basically the reason I'd gone there was this was after Gaddafi died. Um, we were trying to set up a human-centered design academy to help people rebuild the country after the war. And I was there for two months. I was living in a city that was two hours away from a completely ISIS-controlled territory. So when I came back, clearly all the systems in the U.S. just like flagged me. Um, so I was flying through Paris and all the speakers started going crazy, like calling my name. And that just felt completely out of the ordinary. It was not part of the procedure you'd expect. So I was in Target in Paris, then in San Francisco where I landed. And then they let me in. And a week later, two FBI special agents showed up in my school in Vermont uh, wow. to talk further about it. So a lot of these experiences and also the name Terminal 3 comes from the Terminal 3 of Abu Dhabi International Airport, where I was first interrogated when I was flying into the US, which was a very unpleasant experience uh, because I had a visa and I'd worked really hard to get that visa. Uh, but in this moment when my flight was being delayed uh, and I was uh, almost going to miss it because I was being held for interrogation, I just got up and I asked them to let me go because my flight was leaving. I said, I do have a visa. And this interrogation officer kind of shouted at me in front of the whole room. Uh, saying that it doesn't matter to him whether I have a visa or not, he decides whether I go in, and kind of strip my teenage dignity <laughs> in that moment. Um, so since then, I just I've also come to realize that interrogations are just really interesting moments of conversation. It's once you strip away all the institutional elements of why this is happening in the first place. It's essentially two human beings sitting down, mm -hmm. one person trying to figure the other person out with a really weird, absurd kind of power dynamic. It's drama. Yeah. It's the essentials of drama. Exactly. So I thought that putting the viewer in that position and exploring this idea of a contemporary Muslim identity in this country um, through this lens would be very interesting. Huh. So would you say that part of, uh, part of what, bir what birthed Terminal 3 was an obsession maybe not obsession, but uh, you know, not being able to get over your own experience that, that you've consistently had? Um, I just Not that you should have to get over that yeah, experience. Yeah. I mean, part of it was, uh, you know, what, what do I do well? Um, I'm working with augmented reality. It's what do I know? Yeah, so uh, augmented reality is something I, uh, I think it has a unique potential to bring people who, are, who live in other parts of the world or people you cannot get to experience directly bring their presence in your space and allow you to look at your space and your life essentially differently. And um, who are these people I can bring on now? And the first thing that makes the most sense was that uh, something that I have a closer experience with and everything kind of just came together. Um, interrogations are funny. I, I kind of enjoy them and joke about them from time to time. It's a great way to generally pass time while you're waiting for your next flight, like to, for just someone to attentively sit and take notes and be paid for it. Uh, Have you gotten to a place with with being interrogated where you do it jovially and get along with your interrogators? Oh, oh, I totally do. The FBI complimented my hair. Um, it was a whole thing. 
we had an hour long interview and then I told them my mom told me to get my beard trimmed for this interview and the FBI was there like so sorry your mom had to feel that way because of this tell her you you have great hair and <laughs> I told my mom she was quite happy about that so you end up getting along with so what uh, well let's get to the details of terminal 3 one more second but what does that mean that your personal relationship is with uh, the way Americans and the American government treats the Muslim community in this, or perceived, excuse me, perceived Muslims in this country? Because you have sort of what seems like a good working relationship with those that interrogate you, yet at the same time, I assume you maybe wrongly feel that uh, you shouldn't be interrogated as much and that this is an infringement upon your rights. So I, I want this project to almost not be about the current political climate, although that I can see why people would assume that. It's rather obvious. Well, I would take, I mean, take this administration out of the conversation. I mean, this has yeah, been yeah. going on since 9-11. Sure. So, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I just want the project to be, in general, about a more timeless idea of people just crossing borders and crossing uh, cultural identities and going from one place to another and having like these complicated, deep, contradicting personalities that take from multiple cultures and multiple things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So our holograms like really reflect that. Um, we have six different people that are, we're showing at Tribeca that we've basically interviewed. These are all real people. We sit down with them and have long conversations and then use all the material uh, and kind of make this, build this bronzing narrative out of it. Um, and we have some really compelling, interesting stories like we have this woman, Aisha, who, uh, whose, whose parents are from Pakistan. Uh, her, her dad's from Pakistan, her mom's uh, from the US, and they married, and uh, Aisha has been living in LA for a while, and Aisha's story, when you explore it while interrogating her, it starts to get really surreal. So you start off with, show me a passport, where are you coming from? But then it starts to go into, what is your relationship with the moon? Like, mm -hmm. to describe an experience of, you know, she describes this, experience of her being in the Sahara Desert once with her friend, and this is all real stories. And how does, um, how, how does the, the user, viewer, user, what is the appropriate term for? I think viewer would. Viewer, how does the viewer know what questions to ask? So the viewer is actually given a choice of questions. So okay. when you're sitting with the hall and interrogating this person, you see a question pop up every now and then, and you see two questions pop up every now and then. And then once you have two questions, uh, you choose one of them to make the decision in terms of the bronzing narrative and decide where you're going. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might get two questions. One might be, um, how did your parents meet? And one might be, did you get in touch with the Taliban while you were in Pakistan? So uh, the viewer constantly has this choice of asking a question that would be very institutional and dehumanizing and also asking a question that would actually be very intimate and personal and would show your interest in their story. And as you get to know their story more and more, their hologram starts to appear more and more realistic. So it starts off kind of like this, like really green, blue, and glitchy, and uh, holographic. And as you talk more and more, it starts to appear more realistic. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you find, I, I hate to keep bringing this back to your experience, but I'm curious, in your experience, how often do you find the interrogations are ever uh, humane or are approaching a conversation about you as a person rather than just sort of a dehumanizing institutional type interrogation? More often than you would expect, um, yeah. And once again, they may not get as uh, personal as, sure. as, you know, <clears throat> have you ever been in love kind of questions. That's definitely something that we're taking the freedom to explore. Um, but they do get personal enough that someone's like, oh, wow, like, you work with holograms, tell me more about that. Right. Like, I actually want to know what's happening with this. Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about VR now? Like, then it just starts <laughs> to become a more of a personal conversation. However, that's also one of the interrogation techniques that they use, which Those is to more. make you feel comfortable and uh, get into more personal moments. And then just, because essentially what you're trying to do is figure out this person. Mm -hmm. And what else is, you know, the objective of storytelling is to be able to tell a compelling story about a human being's experience. So I just thought it's, it works out. Everything kind of just comes and fits together. What would you say are the, obviously augmented reality, it's further along than, I mean, we didn't even know what augmented reality was a few years ago, you know? What, what would you say are still the biggest challenges when it comes to making sure that the, that the viewer is 
firmly cemented in the, the world that you're creating? So I think it, what's important is to understand that frequently when people talk about immersive technologies, they say VR, AR, and there is a slash in the middle. It's like VR, AR, XR, immersive, immersive. It, the, there's never a distinction between the two. What's XR? Uh, XR is another new industry term that people are using for, some people say it's experience reality. Um, some people say it's like experimental reality. But the idea is that it's, it's a broader term that covers both AR, VR. Um, I'm gonna be really stupid here for a second, but VR is full headset. Augmented is you know things are sort of exist within the world that you already yeah, see around so, you. So the easiest way to understand it is something called the reality continuum. So on one hand, you have reality, the physical reality that we're in right now, where you can go and touch things and everything. But the other extreme end is virtuality or virtual reality, where you would put a headset and you're completely taken off out of your reality and you're in a completely new space. In the middle is mixed reality that has two different types of mixed reality. There's augmented reality, when you're mainly in your reality, but there's one or two objects being added to your reality. And then there's something called augmented virtuality that no one talks about because it's not that interesting, is that you're in virtual reality, but a real object is augmented in it. So you might be in virtual reality, but you might have a physical keyboard that actually exists in real life that you might be able to type on, things like that. Um, but so uh, augmented reality is what I find most fascinating and interesting right now because it starts with your space. It matters where you are. It matters the context of where you're in. And as a creator, you're, you're working with that as your canvas. So you just have to add one thing, and it automatically changes what you think about your space and how you view your space. So even after you take off the headset, since you've had this interaction with the hologram in your space, uh, you look at your space completely differently. There's kind of a ghostly presence of the hologram left behind even after the headset is gone. I think that's very powerful. Wow. So what was your biggest challenge in producing this? Um, is it so the storylines, getting all of the stories? The stories are tough. Like making a truly kind of interactive bronzing narrative is really hard because you want the viewer to have enough choice, but at the same time you want them to kind of go through a dramatic arc. Yeah. Um, so... We solve that right now by giving you limited choices at a time and also making sure we maintain an illusion of choice while sometimes forcing you down the same path uh, without you really recognizing that. So it's a mixture of that. Um, and the viewer has such a limited amount of time. If you had some of those choices lead only to walls, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. there's the possibility that they're walking out of there with a very limited experience. We make sure that you go through a climax. Like It, it builds up for sure. So. For the experience to end, you would have gone through a, a longer moment with the hologram getting actually very personal and intimate and very um, representational in terms of what they look like, very realistic. Um, but the challenge is, of course, augmented reality to begin with is really hard to develop for, super expensive, very limited, not much, no one has any experience working with it. This is the first major AR narrative piece that I've seen out there. I'm in the industry. I cannot think of any other piece that I would say, okay, that was like a major AR narrative experience. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, um, when, you were, when, you were, when you were building this out, when you decided to go with a border control agent as you know, putting the viewer in the shoes of a border control agent, was it difficult or was it your intention to make sure that that agent wasn't perceived as negative in any way or that there wasn't a kind of, like this person is cynically views who they're interrogating or anything like that? So in doing the interviews, we actually uh, would bring in the person, the subject we're doing, we're working with, and um, we would got, go through kind of a mock interrogation um, with a bad cop first. So this person would try to intimidate you, ask you hard questions live. It's like almost a weird moment of play acting for 10 minutes. And then we would do the same thing with a good cop, someone who's a bit more understanding, someone who wants to listen to your story. And that's kind of where some of the material came from. And the interesting thing is that as the interrogator, you have the choice to go down a more intimate poetic uh, road or be more just harsher and try to figure this person out in a much more institutional and sterile way. How often do you find viewers go down the harsher road just to sort of see what happens? Uh, surprisingly little. Wow. I think people feel certain pressure to not want to do that and also, just the more personal, intimate questions just seem more intriguing and interesting to ask. Mm -hmm. 
And a lot of people have come out saying that, wow, this is not a job I want to do. This has reminded me because the questions I'm supposed to ask are actually not that interesting. And the questions I'm not supposed to ask are what I find myself being pulled towards more. Um, but we've had people say no to, because at the end of uh, the experience, you make a decision to whether or not the hologram should be let into the country. And we've had, like, at this point, probably a dozen people say no, um, just to test out what happens. And what happens is, actually, this is a new part that I've not mentioned before. And I, I, I've been keeping it from the press because it has certain shock value in the moment that we wanted to keep uh, for the moment. But um, I think I can say it out now. Um, when you're done with the interrogation in the first room, um, the, you let the hologram know, OK, go into the other room. And in the meantime, you have a disembodied voice in your ear that says, all right, will you let this person into the country or not? It's kind of your supervisor, and he's rough and harsh, and he wants the answer. And then you say, yes, they're good to go, or no, they're suspicious. Once you've made that decision, you get up, and you walk around the corner into the second room where you're supposed to exit from. When you walk in, you realize that you just stepped into another interrogation room. We're on the seat where you had the hologram sitting. Now the real person whose hologram you were interrogating is sitting there in the flesh. And that is the moment that gets to people. After interrogating someone for 10, 15 minutes and getting to hear these really personal, intimate stories, realizing that they were in the space throughout themselves, um, really, like, I've, I've seen people just break down and cry and go up to the hologram and hug them and just, you know, stay there. And um, so I think that's been really powerful, this juxtaposition of, virtual presence with real physical presence and yeah. being able to feel the difference. I'm curious what you think about that says about the limitations of augmented reality versus physical reality. I think that... Um, so often people talk about virtual reality and augmented reality as these things that can kind of open up new pathways to empathy in the brain and we can sort of put people in protests and in other countries and in a scenario like this, but then when you have the, the actual real person there afterwards, and that is what makes them suddenly so empathetic, it still kind of shows that clear uh, line between the two. I think augmented reality is interesting because it has a bit of reality in it. Um, so even in this case, if I just put you directly in a room with a random Muslim or a random person, so what? You know, there's nothing new or interesting about it. You probably don't want to engage. It's, it's not a show. Nothing's happening. If you see one of these people crossing the street, you probably don't care. However, after having gone through that holographic experience of interrogating them, and you walk into the other room and see them, you don't even have to talk. You just see them, and you just break down. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to say something about how much of a presence you can, you can actually build with augmented reality. Because um, at the end of the day, if you're using augmented reality, you're trying to deal with reality itself. You're trying to change reality itself. So by bringing in these holograms in augmented reality, you hopefully try to change someone's outlook on reality. You try to bring back focus on reality using AR. Would you say enhancing, enhancing reality for the purposes of uh, shaping how we view our own view reality? Absolutely. I think that the world is just based off so many, um, you know, kind of unjust ideas that have existed for thousands of years at this point, and they're just hard to change because they're based in this physical reality. So if someone tries to change them, you have to deal with institutions and corporations and the structure and the world, you know? But if you're working with augmented reality or virtual reality, you can actually just build new worlds and build them in, bring them into the world and have them have real impact on how the actual physical world also works. I have questions? Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Um, so I was at the Tribeca Talks where you mentioned that your parents couldn't come to the festival because of the security or visa issues. Um, I was wondering if they got to try out this uh, augmented reality or anybody else uh, in the Muslim community got to try it and what their reactions were after trying. Yeah, so the irony is that my parents actually applied for a visa to come see this, uh, the premiere of the project. They've never been to the US, and both of their visas were rejected. Um, we're just ahead to what this project is about. Um, also, they went through really thorough interrogations. 
to a point where I found out I had some family members, like some stepmom my mom had or something that I didn't even know about. That's how thorough the interrogations were. Um, but what, yeah, so for your question, I, we've actually had people who are immigrants or people who are Muslims try the experience at Tribeca and just come out of, of a, uh, the experience with a very different understanding of what it was initially intended to be. Um, it's kind of being able to be on the other side of the table and see uh, what feelings you would have while you kind of deal with the new human being. Um, so yeah, I, it's a shame. I really wanted my parents to come here um, because when I got into Tribeca, I, I was at Sundance at that time, just you know talking to the programmers and everything, and I got super excited. I called my parents and I'm like, they want me to graduate. I don't want to graduate, um, so I have to convince them. I have to impress them now. Um, so I called them and I was like, How much time do you have left in school? I have another year and a half. Yeah, that's not that long. I suppose. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with your parents on this one. Uh, so I called them, and I was like, OK, listen. My project is going to be one of the first augmented reality experiences to premiere the Tribeca Film Festival in New York. And my mom's like, um, you're going ex to have to explain that a bit yeah. more. Um, so like, I was like, OK, the best way to explain it is to just come over. But that couldn't work out. But I think now I can tell them I'm doing an interview at a place where Priyanka Chopra is having an interview next. <laughs> and that's the only thing they're going to care about, and they're going to love it. So Priyanka is going to be your exit strategy yeah, for school? That's, that's my exit strategy. <laughs> uh, for school, for getting a visa, everything. Um, th this moment is important. <laughs> uh, next question, right here. Um, I guess you've touched upon it around the empathy question. I'm, I'm just going to push that a little bit further. So. A, did you feel like you achieved your goal? And then B, around that same context, D, within the limitations of technology, I'm just curious why you chose to actually have the viewer be the interviewee, the person interviewing, as opposed to the other way around. Because Yeah. So OK, that's a great question. Because the thing with virtual reality is there is this term called the empathy machine. People describe virtual reality as an empathy machine. And I think that that term at this point is really overused and redundant and um, slightly annoying even because it leaves the viewers with the sense of uh, moral superiority of some sort. So you go in, you try a 360 video of a place far away from you that is having financial troubles or is in war. And you come out of it really moved, but now you think that you know what it feels like um, just with this 15 minute exper experience. And it's just very delusional, I think. So it's weird, too, because movies were called the empathy machine for a while as well. It's almost like any new uh, art form that involves humans. You know, yeah. It's like, oh, this is the empathy machine. This is the empathy machine. And it's not really clear if an empathy machine is necessary. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, the reason I think that I went with augmented reality and also having the viewer not be... Um, not be kind of the subject or not be the most important person in the room almost. Um, uh, because I, I, it's not about you stepping into someone else's shoes. It's about someone else coming to your space and changing how, it, how you will look at your reality forever. Like in virtual reality, you put on a headset and you go away to another geographic location that you cannot really figure out where it is. And when you take it off, it just existed in this dreamscape. But in augmented reality, you know where you are. You can physically touch, you look around, it's reality. And then now you have this added object with a story that you just perceive to be real because you are in reality. And you're playing this character that is only figuring out this person while this person is the pr one with the actual main story. So you're really just the trigger. But as a viewer, it just makes the whole experience so much more vivid because you have to say out these questions and you start to feel responsible for them a lot more. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was wondering, since the viewer themselves are being put into a very uncomfortable power dynamic, are people walking away with kind of the same reactions, or are people having kind of specific reactions? Um, so it's interesting, because the power dynamic is really strong in the first room, the, the two rooms. So in the first room, not only are you the interrogator, trying to figure this person out who, whose fate is in your hands, but you're also the real person in the room while the other, the other is just a representation. Um, however, when you walk into the second room, that dynamic is 
switched off at once. It's twisted around completely because you are in this space where this other person has already been and they're clearly more comfortable here and you're going through this moment of shock. So the power dynamic is completely switched. So when you come out of it, that's why a lot of people come out very moved. Um, but to answer your question, I have seen a lot of people come out with very different responses. Some people really get into the role, and when they go into the second room, they say out loud, they're like, yeah, you're good to go, or not. Um, the few people who have taken the risk of saying no to just see what it feels like have like been texting me later about how it's still haunting them, although, although they knew that it was just, it's just like a game, it's just a little moment. But the whole idea of the project is that that's how policy decisions are made. That's how fake news is spread. That's how trolling is done when the person you think you're engaging with is only an abstraction of a human and you don't feel the weight of their reality. And that's what this project kind of allows you to feel in that last moment. So in a lot of ways, it is very connected to our current political environment. I mean, I, I, wanted, I want to say that it's trying to address the themes that are more timeless and are not only trying to address what's happening right now, but yes, at the same time, and abstraction of course, of, are, yeah, are very so timeless. Since yeah. these are timeless themes and they're so relevant right now, it is also addressing these themes right now. Well, congratulations. I hope that you uh, have great success with this and also m maybe finish school as well for, for your mom and dad's sake. Uh, and thanks for being here. Congrats once again. Everybody Thank give you. us a round of applause. Let's hear it. Thank you.